Good morning. <clears throat> Thanks for coming out this morning. I mean, look at this, huh? Oh my gosh. This is what I say to students, you know, you, that, that came from a distance, that they didn't grow up in Ohio. And I think you, know, you came all this way and you came to the Miami and Ohio instead of, you know, maybe like the Miami looking at that all the time. And I'm glad I have you, but I wonder about your judgment. I mean, look at this, to look at this all the time. Wow. Um, so I'm Pat Haney from the Political Science Department. Um, thanks for coming out this morning. Um, I'm grateful to be here, but my students are even more grateful that I'm here because they don't <laughs> have to listen to me for a change. So. Uh, they feel bad for you, though. So, but, but thanks for coming. I wanted to talk a little bit about the past election cycle and some of the things that we might start to watch for in the new election cycle that's already beginning. Yeah. I mean, the, we've already, as I'll talk about in a minute, the first polls are out from New Hampshire <laughs> already. So we're ready to roll. I, I, I think they're, no, I'm not kidding. Oh. The, uh, you watch, where, watch where these turkeys are. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, Chris Christie's leading uh, already. He's the early leader in New Hampshire. So, I, <laughs> that's nice. Oh yeah. So we're off and running already. I think you know the, 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 these guys were already uh, men and women. We're already traveling to to Iowa to start to try and lock up precinct captains before Obama was even uh, uh, sworn in for a second term. So it's it's always election seasons uh, somewhere. So we'll talk about the. Uh, the next one, some today, uh, today too. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do, though, because I know a couple of you at least were uh, around for Alumni Weekend this summer um, uh, on campus, where I talked about, in particular, about how foreign policy issues might be playing out in, at that time, the coming election. And I, I just wanted to do a really quick sort of here's a couple of ways that foreign policy played out in this election, in this past election too, to sort of finish the story from the summer and then talk about what we learned. Uh, about that um, for, the, um, for the next one. So <clears throat> this is a slide from the summer where I talked about how, uh, for the most part, we talk about elections as pocketbook events. That if the economy's going well, the incumbent will probably get reelected, and if the economy's tanking, then the incumbent probably will, uh, will lose. And uh, so it's the famous line from when Bill Clinton was running for president. Um, that uh, Carville hung up in the war room, it's the economy, stupid. You know, stay focused on the economy. Don't get drug into any other issues. Lock on. It's all about the economy. You do that, and we will win. And obviously, they were right. And what, what I was talking about in the summer was, you know, as much as we think that, there also certainly have been cases where foreign policy loomed very large in an election cycle. Um, and these, you know, many of these are ones that you all will remember and hopefully remember fondly. The, the classic Johnson Daisy ad, where Lyndon Johnson wanted to paint Barry Goldwater as simply too extreme to be elected president, across the board on a range of issues. And the way that he did that in foreign policy was to run this ad with the little girl picking the petals off of a flower, off of a daisy, and she was counting one, two, three, and as she got to 10, the big dangerous voice came in and counted down from 10. And then at zero, boom, mushroom cloud, and everybody dies. And Lyndon Johnson's voice came on the video and said, these are the stakes. And remember the classic you know, line about Barry Goldwater that, the, you know, that you've got to come out and vote, and you've got, you've got to do it because this guy is simply too crazy to be president. So. Foreign policy was one of the very significant issues in that election. In 1988, uh, uh, Michael Dukakis staged an ad, a staged a thing where he got in a tank and drove around. He looked like an idiot. He looked so bad that the Bush people actually ran an ad about Dukakis in the tank, painting him as reckless on defense and you can't trust him. And that certainly was one of a variety of issues that helped to seal his fate. 1984, there was this classic ad. It was just a bear in the woods. It was just a bear walking around in the woods, just a big old bear. Doesn't seem like anything until you realize there's a person standing next to it. You know? So the whole point was better safe than sorry, right? There's some people that say the Soviet Union isn't a big bear, right? But maybe it is. Which would you rather be if you were that person in the woods? You know? So you, they wanted to paint you know, the sort of better safe than sorry, don't trust the challenger. And so while 1984 was certainly 
all about the economy, right? This was the, are you better off now than you were four years ago? They still had a powerful foreign policy message as part of that campaign. So I want to go back and just show, remind you of one ad. Uh, some of you may not have, um, may not remember this one from 2004, more recent. In a dangerous world, even after the first terrorist attack on America, John Kerry and the Liberals in Congress voted to slash America's intelligence operations by six billion dollars. Cuts so deep they would have weakened America's defenses. And weakness attracts those who are waiting to do America harm. <clears throat> I'm George W. Bush, and I approve this message. I love this ad. I, I love everything about this ad. This, this really may be one of my favorite ads. Um, so the, this was a sort of sequel to the bear. You know, if the, the bear symbolized the Soviet Union, right? That's the threat. Is the bear eating you? You think that's scary? How about a pack of wolves, right? How do you like to deal with them? So, you know, that was the metaphor for Al Qaeda. And it, it locked in this election, right, a re-elect for, for President Bush running against John Kerry was essentially saying, this is a dangerous world, there's a pack of wolves out there, and you, you can't risk what will happen with, with, with this other guy. And, uh, and we know that foreign policy you know, was one of the more significant issues in that 2004 election. Remember, everybody figured there'd be a tape from bin Laden at some point that would come out, and indeed one did come out. And uh, the polling tends to show that that probably played to the advantage of the president toward the end, sort of reminding people that you're at war. Um, uh, but going into it, both sides knew it would come out, but they didn't know for sure whether it you know, might also underscore the fact that bin Laden was still alive so, and make the, make the president look weak. So we didn't know for sure. So the point is, we knew going into this last election cycle that foreign policy could be an issue. The question is, would it end up being an issue? Uh, uh, in, that, in that election. Um, and let me remind you of the other ways that elections are, you know, are significant here, both for foreign policy and more generally. Whoever wins this election is not only going to be president, but they're also going to take a bunch of people into office with them that are going to be making policy decisions. Right? And we, we often forget that one, that it's not just the president. It's also the hundreds of people that end up being brought into government to make policy. And, you know, every day they're making decisions on the fly that presidents never even know about necessarily unless something goes wrong. Um, so they're going to bring people in, they're going to they're, they're going to make policy decisions, and also they're going to put people on the court. So we've already seen in the in the new term uh, a little up and down on that, right? That didn't put didn't end up putting Susan Rice anywhere, right? There's just too much opposition on that one. Um, but already in the foreign policy area, we've seen John Kerry, the new Secretary of State. Uh, Chuck Hagel not, uh, uh, confirmed the other day for, for defense. So you've seen that rollout, that sort of elections have consequences, and one of them is the cycle of people that come into government um, and make decisions. Um, and in the foreign policy domain, we saw you know, a couple of great uh, campaign commercials, not as good as the Wolves, uh, from both candidates. Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Projections with regard to Supreme Court decisions that will be made in the next four years? I'm not a Supreme Court guy, okay. so uh, yeah, but I, 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 I think that in general I would say that you know, the court has been ruling from time to time pretty consistently in this last decade about the limits or extremes of presidential power, and a lot of those cases have come out of the foreign policy domain. And the president has not done, the presidency has not done well in those court cases. You know, they've gotten beaten up a little bit on it which runs contrary to the trend line that we had been seeing, really, of court kind of getting out of the way, letting presidents kind of reign as much as they want, like Congress can pull them in if they want to, but the court really wasn't going to do it. So we've seen you know, courts start to chisel away a little bit at that. And I think that would, you know, from, from my domain in foreign, in foreign policy, the thing to really kind of watch would be, do some of these other cases come up? So like, for example, we'll talk about um, uh, a little bit more in the next session. Um, you know, to what extent can President order drone strikes on, a, on, on Americans abroad, right? To one thing or order drone strikes on somebody else's citizens, but can, can a president just order a hit, essentially, on an American citizen with no 
right? No due process or anything. So I mean, that's the kind of thing that you would expect at some point to get before some courts. So, you know, and right now the courts are relatively, relatively closely divided on those issues. Those have been, you know, those have been some tough cases. So in this last election, let me just remind you too, there are a couple of nice commercials that, that both candidates threw out there. Um, remember the uh, Romney uh, paint, tried to paint Obama really as more sort of traveling rock star kind of thing, which remember McCain tried that too, uh, rather than really substantively focused on policy issues. Um, uh, uh, he also ran a, 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 a campaign commercial where he talked about Obama going on an apology tour. He's on an apology tour, always apologizing for America, and I won't apologize for America, the sort of American exceptionalist message, which didn't end up working for, for Romney. Obama also had an ad, but his form, he had a little ad about, about Romney, but he, he was able to play the incumbency advantage on this and just talk about, and his great ad was about challenges, the challenges that lie ahead. And the first scene in the challenges ad was the red ticker, Bin Laden is dead, right? So, right, they didn't make the banner, right? Not a mission accomplished banner that they made, right? You just showed a red ticker. I mean, that's, that you're just running with your foreign policy message right there. So it's it, it, interesting you know, how those kinds of themes play out um, in elections. Um, and interesting to think about you know, what that means going, uh, going forward. So. Sometimes we see foreign policy as a disqualifier in, in elections. Uh, Johnson and I, I was hoping, right, remember AUH2O? Is that just one, like one of the best campaign slogans ever? You know, I'd love that. The students today have no idea. A, uh, huh, what, AUH2O? So, yeah, well, you'd think they would get it, right? So, uh, Johnson and then the Daisy ad, and I think in this last election, for a little while, the Democrats were going for that. The Democratic National Convention was loaded with foreign policy themes. Uh, and I've been trying to set out that suggestion that, you know what, this Romney guy, he may not even meet the minimum threshold in foreign policy competence to be president. I mean, I think they had their pedal to the metal there for a little while. They had to, I don't think it ended up quite taking off the way they wanted. But they were certainly, I think, going for the fences on, on, on that one. The Romney people were using it as a wedge issue in a couple of ways. On China, for sure, right? On day one, I will call them a currency manipulator, whatever that means. Um, but I think they're trying to sort of use foreign policy as, as a wedge issue. And certainly in Benghazi, in Libya, trying to use that as, as a wedge issue. I don't think that quite worked for them either. One of the other things that we know from political science literature is how strong the power of incumbency is. And so you think about something like, like Hurricane Sandy, right? And, and the way people tend to rally around the president in a crisis, the way they tend to support a halo is the idea that people support a president when it does something that looks successful to them. And when you're the incumbent, right, to be able to actually be the one delivering as opposed to the one talking about, if I were president, I would deliver. That's a huge difference in, in, in messaging. So real power of incumbency there that I think Obama was able to take advantage of. Um, the, the other thing, this last bullet point is kind of interesting is, there's a school of thought out there, it's not the majority opinion in political science, but it certainly is a, is a significant one. That presidents will on occasion use force, even limited force, in order to divert people's attention away from difficult domestic political circumstances. Uh, they call it the, sometimes called the wag the dog phenomenon from that horrible movie, Wag the Dog, that I never quite understood. Um, uh, but there's another school of thought that says, you know what, that is so craven <laughs> to, to, to think that someone would actually put American lives or any lives at risk in the use of force just to try and gain a 1% bump in approval or something like that. So I find it hard to believe, but beyond that, there's a lot of evidence that suggests presidents would be just as happy to get foreign policy out of elections because it's, it's so, uh, not just controversial, but it's so unpredictable. You never know what's gonna happen once shots are fired. And so they kinda like to get it out of the way. I think there are a lot of people, some think it's a good thing, some think it's a bad thing, that would suggest that in the election cycle, but even more broadly, the Obama folks have been trying to sort of keep a lid on things that are happening around the world. 
you know, get it out of, of the agenda, that that's not sort of our comparative advantage is to try to be all these different places. And so I think you saw some of that in the election, just trying to kind of keep a lid on things, not have them blow up. And as you look forward, I think you start to say, well, you know what, that, that may be one of their foreign policy impulses, is to just kind of try to manage, but not big, bold strokes. And that they've sort of drawn a lesson that the big, bold strokes are the kinds of things that get you in trouble in the long, in the long run. So that's kind of interesting to think about as you set up for the next cycle. If that's the sort of the foreign policy instinct of the current White House, what's going to happen as we turn toward the, the next cycle? Now, beyond just foreign policy stuff, I know this is hard to see, but I want to point out a couple things. So this is the electoral map from 2012. And there's a couple of interesting things to note here. This is, my, this is my Marco Rubio moment here as I grab my bottle of water. I know. See, they tell you to never plan a joke, but you have to plan that one and use it. I mean, how, how do you walk away from the Marco Rubio drinking the water joke, right? So a couple things to, to note about this. So blue, obviously, right, that's Obama, and red would be um, uh, not Obama, obviously. Uh, and uh, note, right, as we talked about in the summertime, uh, we all grew up on the idea that every election, those things flipped. Because red was bad, right? Red was communist, right? Yeah. Communist sympathizer was pink, right? A pinko. So remember, they used to switch that every election cycle. And in 2000, it just so happened that that was Gore's turn to be blue and Bush's turn to be red, but now it's locked, right? Now it's like blue and red forever. So, so now it's always blue uh, for the Democrats and Romney would be red uh, in this case. So, um, you, can, you can see the Electoral College totals uh, uh, down here. A couple of things that are interesting to think about from the map from the last couple of elections going forward. One is obviously the blue Ohio and the blue Florida. And those are states that have ping-ponged around a little bit lately. Um, another thing that, to notice, I think, is uh, the blue New Mexico and the blue Colorado. Those are also ones that have ping-ponged around a little bit in, in recent elections but that are clearly trending toward blue. You know, that, that's where that one's going, for sure. And so you start to wonder about, oh, look at that, now Nevada's blue. And you start to wonder, well, if, if, if that's where things are going, how much longer can Arizona be red? And in the long run, how much longer can Texas be red? So I think when, when, when a lot of folks are looking just at the electoral map, they're starting to say, you know what, there's some, some, some underlying dynamics of these elections that may not fully be appreciated in 2016, but a decade from now, this map is going to look very different if the parties stay right where they are. Now, parties don't stay right where they are, but you know, if it were just a trend line straight one direction. The other one to note here, I think, too, is Virginia. Right? Virginia now going blue. North Carolina did in the previous election, but came back red for this one. Uh, just barely. Um, so you, you've got sort of a transformation, really, of the electorate that's very interesting to note, and that I think all these candidates are starting to kind of try to lock onto and figure out uh, what that means. This one I know is impossible to read from where you are, but I'll, let me show you a couple things from it. Top line here, this is men and women voters, right? Big advantage uh, uh, for Obama among women, but for Romney among men. But the electorate was 55% women. Um, white voters, Romney did great with. But everybody else, Obama did great with. Uh, an American transformation that's continuing to play out, and the debate is already on, how does the Republican Party position itself relative to that? There's a you know, nice piece actually in the New Yorker this week by Ryan Rosa talking about this debate. It's a piece about Eric Cantor, but embedded in it is this debate about, you know, is when the Republican Party, to the extent that you can talk about just a single, you know, a party as a single entity, when they think about just this box in particular, is the problem the pizza or the box? You know, is it, is it just packaging or is it the pizza that's in the box that we've got to do something about? Um, and, and I think you already see that debate playing out by the positions the different candidates for president in 2016 are taking. Some of them are saying, we need better pizza, we need better sauce, we need better cheese, and others are saying, no, we just need a better box. Um, and so that, you know, that'll be an interesting, interesting one. Now, Democrats have their own challenge, by the way, which I'll get to uh, in a minute. 
Um, this one here, younger voters, older voters. I love this one because it led to a great line the other night. We had a, uh, uh, a new program called the Janus Forum on campus, an ongoing series of discussions about politics. And we had the first one, we packed the house, great event. Ezra Klein came and Ari Fleischer. Ezra Klein, you know, write the wonk blog for the Washington Post and Ari Fleischer, who's the press secretary in the Bush administration, to talk about sort of the state of American democracy, is it broken, and talking about this very trend, Ari Fleischer was walking through with some, in some detail about, you know, younger voters, single voters going Democrat. And so he said, so if I have one message for you here tonight, it is, or one wish that I have for you tonight, it is A, that you grow old, <laughs> <laughs> and B, that you meet someone tonight. <laughs> so, so, right, that's an interesting hypothesis, right, that as these people get older, they will turn Republican. But that's just an hypothesis. It may not work out that way. It may be that they're, because right, younger people didn't tend to vote in the rates that they are right now. It may be that they're starting to establish a habit of voting. They're starting to establish a habit of voting for Democrats. And habits tend to continue. Most of my habits are worse than they used to be as I've gotten older, you know, much more set in stone. So that's an interesting challenge uh, there um, uh, uh, as well. The, the other one here that I want to point out here in the bottom, so this is, uh, uh, so this is urban up here and rural down here. So there, there's also that sort of interesting divide uh, between Republicans and Democrats. And that's been a consistent one that's been breaking out in recent elections too. So as you try and map those things on the future, you wonder, okay, so is this a straight line? So we gotta get positioned that way. Or are all of these things in play uh, all the time? Uh, and that's where I think you start to sort of wonder about the next election cycle. Can we ask a question? Yeah, every time. Is there a chance for the third party that we're really establishing itself and how would that sort of throw a monkey into this whole thing? Because I think a lot of people are very displeased with both yeah, I'm trying to see. Is, I was trying to, yeah, there's George. So George said, George, is there a third party in Seattle? Uh, not worthwhile. But is there one? Greens? There's, one there's a Green Party. <laughs> there's one party in Seattle. <laughs> uh, the Green Party in Seattle? Well, there's a Green, but it doesn't carry much. But it's around, right? I mean, you know it, it has some salience. Yeah. Right. Maybe something more like the real Republican Party of the uh, Lincoln era or the early Thomas Jefferson or the, you know, Dwight Eisenhower or Bob Michael or something like that. Dwight Eisenhower is a great example. Right. I mean, he was, I don't think he was either a Republican or a Democrat. He was, they're both whatever. Yeah, so <clears throat> I mean, uh, it's a, a couple of really good things there when you think about these candidates from both sides that are com coming forward. So. One thing to note is, you know, will there ever be a third party? The American political system is designed to quash third parties. When you have a winner-take-all system, you have a choice. You can be a winner, or you can be a loser. You know, I mean, that's really it. Now, in some local elections, smaller parties can sometimes compete, but they tend to be kind of out. Now, in Cincinnati, um, there, there was a third party, and, and some of these candidates, uh, they'll, they tend to run as Republicans these days, they will still call themselves a charter right. Cincinnati had this third party at one point that was a good government party, and, and Cincinnati was a charter form of government, and so they called themselves the charter rights. We believe in the charter, not in ideology. So you'll see those kinds of things sometimes in local settings, but at the national setting, when it's win or lose, that tends to drive those sort of third party movements out. And the parties themselves, Republicans and Democrats, have such advantages over how the whole process works that when something starts to emerge, Ross Perot, right? Remember, Ross Perot polled voters roughly evenly from both sides. He hurt both candidates about evenly. Um, uh, and, and think of the momentum he had, couldn't sustain it, right? Both parties were grabbing at that. Clinton grabbed a big chunk of it. The Republicans tried to grab a chunk back. Ross Perot, uh, you know, you probably know better than me, kind of lost interest, I guess, and there was no sort of infrastructure to really carry that through. The parties are able to just devour those things that pop up in the middle. So I think you're right that these third parties tend to happen sort of out on the, uh, on the tail end of either of the, of the sort of political humps. 
Yes, or single issue, yeah, or very single issue focused. So the other thing, though, is to think about the Eisenhower example. Um, back in, when Eisenhower was governing, he governed with essentially the same folks in the country and in the Congress that Lyndon Johnson did and that Richard Nixon did, right? Because the Democrats were distributed more to the left than to the right, but they had a bunch of people in the middle and they were conservative Democrats, and the Republicans were you know, evenly distributed, more to the right, but a bunch in the middle, and Eisenhower and Johnson governed right in the middle of that big bell curve with Republicans and Democrats who were sort of in the middle. But the parties have transformed themselves in the last 20 years, and so and they've cleansed themselves, they've purged themselves, and they continue, especially with the primary seasons, to purge themselves even further. So that instead of having you know, this sort of bell curve kind of thing, you've really got a two-humped camel. And there's not much in the middle. And so, and we were just debating this in class the other day, I was showing them all this sort of data about this, that the, the, the debate that people have right now is the parties are, have certainly become more ideologically pure. They don't cross-cut much anymore which means there's also not much incentive for them to cross-cut. You step over the aisle, you get whacked with a primary challenge. Um, so the parties have become more pure. Um, think, of, uh, think about Indiana. That was a nice example, right? Richard Luger, not conservative enough, right? The Tea Party guys, and I love that story too. You know, the, the guy that was going to do that was a guy named Mike Delf, who's um, he's in the state legislature now. But he was um, uh, Dan Burton's legislative guy for a long time. But uh, the Murdoch got in first. So Delft couldn't get in, right, or, or anybody else, because then if you divide the Tea Party, you know, the Tea Party, so-called Tea Party vote, then Luger would end up winning the primary. So only one can go. He ends up winning the primary, and Indiana, the people in the middle, and, and the Democrats on the left, Right at the last minute, it got late before that, that race turned, but ended up going for the, for the Democrat. A seat they may not be able to hold in the long run, but six years, it's, good. it's a good run, you know. So, uh, so you have that sort of purging going on to some extent that the parties do, but the question is where, are, where is the public? And a lot of political scientists and others who study these things think that the public is also becoming polarized. Um, that we watch the news that we want to watch and not the news that we don't want to watch. You know, my, my father-in-law is all Fox News all the time. I'm all Golf Channel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't yell on there. There's no, and it's pretty. It's always pretty wherever they are. You know, it's rainy sometimes, but it's pretty rainy, you know, and there's not yelling. So you pick the news that you want to hear, you know, and you don't, you're not confronted with the news that you don't want to hear. Um, so, but, but most political scientists still say, you know what, the public is in the middle. The problem is, at election time, there's no middle. There's only this one over here and this one over here. And so where is that candidate who will speak to the middle? And I, I think that's one of the, one of the that, that's the, the pizza or the box you debate. The primary, right? well, she can't the primary, the exactly. You know, if, if you start saying, hey, look, there's, there's a big middle up here to come and grab, um, but what happens when you go through, in the Republicans case, when you go through South Carolina as an early primary, you know? So we had uh, one of our alums, Daryl West, was on campus recently. He graduated in 1970-something. Um, had a career at Brown University as a political scientist. Now he's at, uh, he's at the Brookings Institution now. And Daryl gave a lecture, and his view of all this was um, however much the re Republicans fight over pizza or box, the ones who are running for president are going to go for the middle. They're going to go for where Hispanics and where non-Cuban Hispanics, although increasingly Cuban Hispanics too, where um, Asian Americans are, where young voters are, they're going to go for the middle, and you'll watch them go as fast as possible on immigration. That's where you'll really see them run for the middle. And uh, Daryl West is a better political scientist than I am. But he called, them, he called those folks the presidential wing of the Republican Party. But they've all got to run through New Hampshire and Iowa and South Carolina. And so I don't know, you can't get out there too far on those issues or, or you'll lose those. So that's why, I th when you think about who's coming up next, 
you know, I already used the Chris Christie line, right? And you know, Marco Rubio, somebody named Jeb, right? Lurks out there too, right? But I also think, in terms of candidates, you got to watch for rules and dates, you know, because you know the parties redo their rules and dates all the time of when primaries are. And is it going to be proportional, or is it going to be winner take all out of primaries? And how many super delegates are they going to have? And, and, and so you wonder will the, will the party mechanism itself try and create a system coming up for the next one where you don't have primaries that will drive candidates to an extreme that then lose in a general election because the middle, they've gone too far? Do you ever have a national primary? Or do you go that way? And they're absolutely. Well, we've already shortened it a lot, right, with the Super Tuesdays and the Super Duper Tuesdays and the Quadruple Wednesdays, you know, and those kinds of things, Big Monday or whatever, you know, they call these things, right? And a lot of those were these efforts to try and get, get in some sense, get party control over this more and not have somebody no one's ever heard of win in Iowa or win in New Hampshire and then the press locks onto them as the leader. And the way that the press tends to focus only on a horse race you know, tracking a horse race, because that's an easy story to tell. The next thing you know, somebody's off going to be running for president who can't win. So you try and pull these things to force them to essentially compete more nationally. It takes a lot more money to do that. You know, you need a lot more support, infrastructure support for that. That should parlay when you run in the general then. Um, so if you go more in that direction, have these things shorter in time, more spread out, do you end up getting a candidate that's better for the general election than for these primaries? But remember, it can also cut the other way. Somebody can catch fire. I mean, how many times do we see that, right? You know, in, in sports, for example, somebody catches fire at the right time. They ride it right into the NCAA tournament and just get whacked in the first round, right? So you don't want the flash in the pan. And if you put everything real short in time, you could get somebody who's hot but can't sustain. The idea is if you make them compete across the nation, they've got to be built to sustain. Um, but that, you know, that's the debate. And the, the move has clearly been toward something more like a, you know, you know, not a national primary right now, but you can see that you know, in the long run things might move in that direction. Um, but I think the effort has been to try and use rules and use dates to try and build a better candidate, you know, the bionic candidate, the one that can get through primaries and compete in the general. And remember, we're not talking about Obama right now because he was successful with these things, but we used to say all this about Democrats. Right? They're, the, they're the ones that you know, created candidates in the primaries that couldn't win. So this is a challenge for both parties, not just for the Democrats. There was another, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to make a comment. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great point. That's sort of what I was alluding to earlier when I said, if you can think about parties as one big entity, right? I mean, back in the day, uh, the, the state party mechanism had much more control over who these candidates were and what their rules were. And they often like to exercise that control still today. And so it's also a battle of can the national party infrastructure of both parties enforce rules across the states. Um, I mean, they're, they're essentially franchise operations. Can you make the franchisees all operate under the same set of rules or not? Um, and, and you know that, I mean, Florida right, stands out in your mind for a reason, right? I mean, it turned out to be kind of a fiasco that these things were, they're not following the rules and are those delegates going to get to vote or not? And that's not the news you want going into a convention, you know? But on the other hand, they do run their elections. Their elections are run locally. And so how do you manage that? It's a, it's a real challenge. It's one of the real challenges for parties, I think, to stay relevant in some sense in the face of, and let's get into this on the last slide, in the face of these candidates who essentially are phenomenons of their own, right? They're their own brand name. And that's one of the challenges for the Democrats. Barack Obama is a brand name. But can another candidate do what he did on those same voting demographics? Can they translate that for somebody else? That's the challenge for them. Can the Obama mechanism work for someone that's not named Obama? Or will we be talking about the disarray of the Democrats 
you know, four years from, let's see, four years from now, we'll be back here, I guess, right, as you go every other year in Florida. So for the Republicans, I think it's not just about who are the, the names. And I sent some of the links, by the way, on the website, they weren't working quite right. And usually there, there's something a little extra on the end. You delete a couple of letters and the, the links that were on their website will work. Um, uh, but the, on the Republican side, also Rob Portman, uh, John Kasich from Ohio was on uh, the, the fix from the Washington Post, the fixes list of top 10 to watch. Um, why that? Well, Ohio, right? I mean, Ohio has been key, and I think Ohio will be key again in the next one. Um, Rand Paul, Jeb Bush, Paul Ryan, Bobby Jindal, uh, uh, John Thune. Um, and, and I think the names are, are interesting to watch, but I, I, for the Republican side especially, I also think rules and dates are key, and how that whole thing uh, starts, starts to line up, and, and who can emerge who's, who's built for a general election. On the Democrat side, by the way, that's a really cool elephant graphic that I found. There's, I, couldn't, I couldn't find a, a donkey one that was quite as cool as that one. I like that one. So it's just a more traditional donkey one. <coughs> so, so, so I don't know, you know, I mean, but she's going to run against a sitting vice president. I mean, so uh, the one side, uh, I want to go with this conventional wisdom that says, yeah, this is all about whether Hillary runs or not. That's sort of decision number one. But the huge advantages of being sitting vice president, unless your name is Richard Nixon, right? Richard Nixon ran as a sitting vice president and found out that that's not all good. Remember, um, one of the commercials that was used against Nixon was a press conference with Dwight Eisenhower when they asked Eisenhower, to name one thing that Richard Nixon had sort of decided. And Eisenhower said, well, I don't know. I, I guess if you give me a week, maybe I'll think of one. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I'm sort of an Eisenhower buff. I've been to Abilene and the library and that kind of stuff. And my sense is Eisenhower felt really bad about that. You know, that's not kind of how he meant it. But in those days, the vice president really didn't do anything, you know? So he didn't mean it as a slam. He just meant that, you know, vice presidents kind of hang out. And <laughs> yeah, well, it's changed a little bit. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. He, he was not totally sold on, on, on Nixon. And if you're a sitting vice president, right, remember the other thing you've got to do is you want to grab everything good about the president, but you've also got to distance yourself from the president, right? George Herbert Walker Bush had to do that. He had to find some way to stake his own ground that wasn't Reagan's ground. He did it, do you remember what it was? The war on drugs, right? G getting much more aggressive than the war on drugs, Manuel Noriega, right? That's where, that's where that went. Um, Al Gore tried, he tried with Cuba policy, and he tried this weird balancing act, and it didn't, didn't quite work, and boy, did it end up paying some negative externalities for him when it came to recount time, because uh, the Cuban Americans were, who had been lurching toward Clinton reacted very badly to, to Gore's overtures, and they carried a lot of weight during the recount. Yeah? I, I got a name for this genius bunch of other people. Yeah. How about Michelle Obama? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I got to tell you, I, I, I don't know her, but my sense is she can't wait to get out of politics. <laughs> But I don't know. You never know, right? Um, You've got a good last name. <laughs> uh, she could carry the brand name on. Yep. Yeah. So uh, the fixes list in, uh, beyond uh, Hillary and Joe Biden um, included a whole variety of people that you've probably never heard of unless you really, really watch co closely. But they're all in interesting places, and that's why they're on the list. They're in interesting spots during the primary calendar, or they're in interesting places in terms of where the Electoral College sits. Um, so I think that list is really interesting to watch, uh, to watch too. One of them that I think is particularly interesting to watch uh, when you think about the longer span of things is Andrew Cuomo. You know, I mean, because you probably remember, remember when, when, when his dad was thinking about running, running, not running, and now, now it's time for the son again. Oh, like the son named Jeb. Or, right, or the grandson, what's well, the grandson in Texas who's about to run for something? 
Yeah. Right? So, uh, you know, so it's just interesting to watch, right? You talk about Michelle Obama. Who, who already has a brand name that they can step into? Somebody just popped up. Yeah. I'm from Maryland, and we all know that our governor is running for president. Uh, she's on the fixes list, right? Uh, he's on the fixes list, Martin O'Malley? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Fix uh, and the Washington Post thinks he's running for president, and, ha and this last, now, The Fix, right, they'll, they'll, they'll do this like every week until 2016, you know, and continually renumber people, but he had him at, uh, uh, well, I think he would have been fourth behind Hillary and Biden, next was Cuomo, and then was O'Malley. Then Deval Patrick, Mark Warner, Virginia, um, Janet Napolitano, uh, Gillibrand from New York, Schweitzer from Montana, and uh, Warren from Massachusetts. So, um, so lo lots of names uh, that, are, that are possible. And, you know, the safe bet is it won't be any of them, right? If you're in the, <laughs> bet the field, <laughs> because it's just, it's just too early. But here's, so here's what I, what, I, what I would watch. What happens on voter reform? Um, if, you know, to what extent, especially in the states that are close, you know, or the, the movement toward making it, you know, much more strict kinds of rules about the early voting, for example. But all the momentum is in the other direction, I think. The universal vote by mail that we've seen and uh, absentee voting and that kind of thing. But there's an effort to clamp down on that. And how does that play in the body politic then? Do people feel like, hey, wait a minute, you're trying to take my right to vote away or not? So, you know, the, I think the politics of voter reform at this, far, this point, this far away from the election, that's kind of what I would watch. Another one is those dem that demographic story after Obama. Can, can, can a Democrat sustain that kind of, uh, uh, of momentum? Remember that while non-Cuban Hispanics traditionally vote two-thirds or so, certainly 60% Democrat, George W. Bush had eaten into that number, right? Yeah. He had eaten it, and, and, you know, and Jeb certainly can eat into that number, um, but got whacked on an effort in immigration reform right after the reelect, and, and Hispanic voters fled, and then Obama just sucked them up like a dry sponge, you know, off they came. Uh, Asian American voters do not typically vote 75 25 like they did in this last election cycle. So you've got to think that these things are not set in concrete. So how do new candidates deal with these sorts of demographic changes? Why did Asian Americans vote 75, 25? You know, if you get into the exit polling, and exit polling is not great, right? Get people lie in exit polls. A lot of people don't stick around. They don't want to talk when they come out of the polls. Um, we will learn more about voters later through this thing called the National Election Survey that's a much more sort of reason, social scientific sort of thing, and it tracks some of the same people, literally the same people over time, too. But what we know from the exit polling is a lot of it had to do not so much with identity politics, it had to do with interests. You know? And, and for, for both Hispanics and Asian Americans, a lot of it was about health care, it was about immigration, uh, and on, on, on those sorts of issues, it, it was in their eyes, that meant you vote for Obama. So, you know, I, th I, I think people overdo, I think people can overdo the identity part of things as opposed to the interest part of things. And, and they're pretty locked on to interest. Healthcare it was a key issue uh, for them, too. So, the other one that I would point out, and this is, it doesn't take a genius to think of this one, right? It's the war we haven't met yet and the disaster yet to hit. You know, I mean, you hate to think of it, right? But. I think the likelihood is we'll have one of each, at least. And the question is, who do you end up looking for as the lesson that you learn from that one? If we decide to learn a lesson, for example, that this expansive presidential power, ordering drone strikes around with some hit list somewhere, is just beyond the pale, and we don't want that. But a candidate talks about, you know what, the presidency needs to be scaled back, and any more congressional sort of government might look good to people. On the other hand, if there's a terrorist attack inside the United States again, people might say, you know what, we actually need a stronger president. I don't know. Th those two things could also go in the other direction. That's the point. It's unpredictable. Uh, but what is predictable is there'll be some disaster. 
you know, and there will be some kind of war we haven't met yet. And what will we learn from that? And then who will we look for as a result? Another one that I guess you all were just talking about in here before, right? The economy and sequestration. In the summer, at, at Alumni Weekend, somebody asked, because at that point we were still looking at the full-on fiscal cliff coming, what will happen on the cliff? And I said at the time, I just can't believe we'll actually go over the cliff. Well, we kicked the can a little bit, right? We sort of avoided one, so it's, but it's still a pretty significant sort of uh, speed bump we're, we're, we're hitting starting today. This sequestration was designed to be so ridiculously stupid and awful that no one in his right mind would do it. That was the whole point. And so you created this super committee whose job it was to come up with more reasonable cuts and more reasonable ways to think about revenues so that you blend things and whatever mix people can settle on to do. And the super committee got nowhere. Remember, I mean, do you even remember the super committee? Right? I mean, it, it, it went nowhere fast. Um, and so off we go. Now, this sequestration stuff, it may only last a few weeks. I have no idea. It may only last a month. Or maybe it'll be permanent. Um, uh, but, the, but the idea going in was that sequestration was so awful that no one in his right mind would do it. Well, now we are. And that tells you something about just how locked our political mechanism is right now. I mean, it is just locked down. And so do people look for, like you talked about, a candidate who speaks to the idea, right, who comes from the outside and runs against a pox on everyone's houses, right? Someone like a governor. Oh, I don't know, like from Maryland, for example, or something like that. Right? So that's where I think you, you also start to look, and, and that's why the fixes list is heavy on governors. It's, you know, this may be an environment where somebody who's not currently working with a Washington, D.C. address is the one who's going to look good. Not a senator, not somebody from the House. Maybe somebody who was a governor in a southern state, you know. So, you, know, so you wonder about, about, about that kind of, uh, of dynamic. The other thing that I just think is fun to think about is we know now that the 2012 election was, was really a repeat of 2008. Just a little bit less in some spots for Obama, but it was pretty much a repeat of 2008. Going into it, we thought it was going to be a repeat of 2004. Squeaker, very close, super tight, you know, come down to you know, one state. Well, it turns out it didn't. It turned out it was you know, kind of a blowout. Well, what will 2016 be? You know, will, it, will it be 2012 again? Will somebody be able to cash in on that Obama brand name and just ride that horse? Or will it be more like 2000 or 2004 or something like that? The best part for us, and it really is the best part in Ohio, at Miami is, in either of those scenarios, Ohio is going to be flooded with crazy commercials starting, you know, in about a week. <laughs> which, which I just can't get enough of, you know. I love the commercial. Bring them on. I had one thing. I had a friend of mine that used to teach in Miami. He teaches in Massachusetts right now. And he'll call and say, have you seen any presidential commercials? And I'll say, yeah, I haven't seen any since the New Hampshire primary ended, you know. What are they like? What are they doing, you know? <laughs> no, no commercials in Massachusetts, right? Don't need to. Um, so uh, it's good. I, I think either way it cuts, it's going to be great for Ohio. Those of you who flew down here, I think it's going to be great for Florida. Colorado is still even enough that it's going to be great for Colorado if you like political ads. And if you don't, it's going to be Armageddon. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Did Obama carry Ohio because of the saving of the automobile industry? Has that research been done? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, certainly the, the journalists really locked onto that story. And um, I, 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 I joked with the folks in uh, media relations that, look, I know it's, it's like I'm having my five minutes right now, you know, and I know my five minutes are going to be up. Actually, no one called for an interview. The other, I got a message from Dee Dee Dowdle the other day, you know, could you please, or from Claire Wagner, could you please respond to this phone call, but I was traveling down here, you know, it hasn't happened since the election. But we were, a lot of the folks in the department were in the press a lot, and they were locked onto that auto story. That's what got me in the Washington Post. I had a bunch of Miami grads email and call, you know, they woke up that morning and saw me quoted in the Washington Post. Um, uh, which was like the one thing I wanted out of the elections. I, <laughs> I think that I, I told one of the folks, uh, I don't care where you get me, you get me in the Washington Post. That's what I want to do. 
they were locked onto the auto story. And, and certainly a lot of polling suggests that was, that was a key thing. Um, it certainly played badly for Romney, you know, the, the position, which was not quite what he said, but it was close enough to what he said. And not what he would have seen play out because bankruptcy would have meant reorganization, but he didn't explain that. Right, yeah, it, it, that, was, that one didn't go well, but it's, it's too late, right? That's how these things work. You know, it's all in an instant, it's captured, it's on film, and now you're done. But I, I mean, my own sense of it is that Ohio and the story of Ohio is far more complicated than one single thing, than the auto industry. I, and that's one of the things that the national press, the, like the, the horse race sort of version of the story, don't understand really the different sorts of states that exist in Ohio. And if they understand Ohio very well, they think about the difference between Cincinnati, for example, and Cleveland, and Columbus kind of in the middle. But it, I think if you look at our uh, election returns, both for the national ones, but also for governor's races and, and the Senate races too, it's the other axis that's really interesting. It's, it's Athens, Appalachia, up to Toledo. Those are the ones that really switch. You know, I mean, the parties know the game of squeezing out every last vote in the Northeast or in the Southwest. Everybody knows that game. The hard votes are the ones that are constantly switching. You don't know whose voter they're going to be. And Appalachia moves around a little bit. And up around Toledo moves around a little bit. So auto industry helped on that Toledo part of that axis. But, but it wasn't only, as a result, it's not only auto industry. Those are voters that, are, that move on that axis which means they're voters that someone else could move later. So, and that's what makes Ohio fun. I mean, it's essentially five little states all in one, in one component, a central and in the corners, uh, when it comes time, not just you know, for governor and Senate and, and president. Yeah. The other dynamic here, which is, if we had the votes counted, not winner take all. Right. If it was simply, I got 49% of the votes in Ohio, and I got X number of electoral Right. It'd be a lot different kind of uh, dynamic. Yeah. Right. 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 You get the rural urban right. split there. Right. Right. Yeah, so let, maybe we, we get in on that note a little bit. There are a couple of interesting electoral college reform ideas kicking around out there. Um, and I, I remember you talk about not making predictions. You asked me for a prediction earlier. I remember in class, I was in the 90s at some point, it was before I said, man, I wish we would impeach somebody again, because I think that would be fun. And then the Clinton impeachment happened, and I thought, no, no, that was fun, actually. I think we should impeach presidents more, if you like it all the time, political moves, right? Uh, so uh, teaching the Electoral College, and the students were like, well, I, I mean, if, if it ever turned out the other way again, that uh, somebody who lost the popular vote would win the White House, wouldn't, that, wouldn't people like rise up against that and get rid of the Electoral College? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> Not so much, right? Well, now, so there was a little movement that started after 2000 that, uh, that, that uh, I forget what the latest total is, 10, 12 states have passed that essentially say, once everybody else does it, we will instruct our electors to vote for whoever won the national popular vote. But we're not going to do that until the other states do it too. So there's that model. That would, that would keep the Electoral College, but essentially put it to the service of the national popular vote. The one that you hear more often these days, coming out of this last election, is the one that says maybe we should do, have more states adopt what they do in Nebraska and in Maine. Now, you could do that in a variety of ways, but the basic idea is that you would have a presidential election inside of each congressional district, and so if you win that district, you get one elector. And you win the other district, you get one elector. And then if you win the state as a whole, you get two electors like the two senators. And um, those states have both had that system for a while. They never split those votes up until this last time. Obama, not this last time, the 2008, Obama won the Omaha congressional district in 2008. He did not in 2012. 
Um, so they want split again. But a lot of states were talking about doing that which following this last batch of redistricting would be a big advantage for Republicans if you did that. Some, some states actually voted <coughs> on that in the election and voted it down. Right. No, this, I who it was. Yeah, and, and uh, I think Virginia actually was, and the, and the governor said, I won't sign it. Yeah. So, so you've got that model out there that essentially says do more things like what Maine and, and, and Nebraska do, which is a really interesting model. And depending on how you set the rules up, that, that might have affected a previous election, it might not have, but the key thing is what you keyed on. What I know for sure is it'll make the next election different. You know, the Electoral College forces national candidates. You, know, you can piece together your 270 in a variety of ways. That's why in this last election it was better to be Obama than Romney going in. I had, he had more pathways. If I'm looking at it, I've got more ways to get to 270 than, than Romney did. Romney had one pathway to 270, and he had to run the table on them, right? So you'd rather have the more. Um, the Electoral College gives options on how to, how to add up to 270. You get rid of it altogether, now you just, you, you just start running where the voters are, big cities or something like that. Right? That's what, what small states didn't want to have happen, thus the Electoral College. But now you're talking about things that are more in the middle of either have it or don't have it. And so what would be the impact, and, I mean it's hard to even think about, what would be the impact on how you run campaigns if you start breaking up Nebraska's votes? You know, how do you use the candidate's time in, in, in something that's not a winner-take-all system? I, I guarantee there are people trying to figure that out right now. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to be much different for the next presidential cycle. But it's certainly out there, ways to sort of uh, to alter that system but keep the Electoral College. And the one thing you know for sure is that it will alter how candidates position themselves, how they spend their time, how they spend their money and their resources. And as moves like that, it's likely to make elections even more expensive. Is that what you wanted? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. You're the, you, 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 start to, you start to get your first real sense of what 16 will be like in 14. That'll be your first sort of indicator of where things might be going. But I think, you're right. and I, in, in my head, I was kind of embedding that inside of, you know, the economy. If people start to get a sense that, um, that this may actually be a way, first of all, it's a, if it's a benefit that I like, and I actually am starting to control costs, that could be a huge win. But if people start to get a sense of, yeah, it's a benefit I like, but costs are not being contained, this whole thing may need to be revisited, that changes the whole body politic yet again. So it, it, I think you're right. That's a key one to, to watch, too, Mike. Yeah, Tom? So right now, the Voting Rights Act is being debated in front of the Supreme Court. Right. Um, is that going to Well, I think, and not to be glib about it, I think we're <clears throat> to some extent you look at this map and say, you know what, something like, it might not have much difference. Something that's red is likely to stay red longer. Um, but when you start to look at, that might be your first instinct, but when you start to drill down in the numbers and you think about what's happened in Virginia and North Carolina and Florida and what could happen uh, in, in Georgia, too, um, you got to start to say, wow, you know, if, 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 you can, if you can tighten those voting rules in ways that you know have patterned effects on voters that vote in remarkably high numbers for a Democratic candidate, uh, you may really uh, uh, have something that's got, got impact. Yeah, I think that's why that is, it's just such a, it's a weighty decision on all, for all kinds of reasons, but for, for voting patterns, certainly, too. Yeah. I think we've reached our time. Yeah, but, it, but I mean, it would be true for all of them that, are, that, are, you know, that, that, that it applies to. You know, which is you're talking that's a huge swath of the country that is 
in play heading to the future in ways that it wasn't 10 years ago. And that's why I think it's significant. Are we at time? Is that where we are? Yeah, I think we are. So thank you very, very much. I appreciate you being here.